I'd like to lift the uh, feeling in the room by bringing Peter Hudson to the stage. Peter is one of the world's leaders in studying zoonotic transmission, transmitted diseases, and he has a, an expansive view of what health means. Peter, welcome to the stage. Thank you very much indeed, Rob, and thank you, Twin and winners, and everybody out there for inviting me to come and attend today. So despite the phenomenal progress in the biomedical health over the past 20 years, the development of CRISPR-9, use of gene editing, we are still in the middle of a pandemic. That, to my mind, is not surprising because biomedical health is about looking after the individual and it's not about preventing pandemics. And that's what I want to talk about today. We have to transcend biomedical sciences. We have to embrace not only epidemiology, epidemiology, gosh, you wouldn't think I was an epidemiologist, would you? And epidemiology, um, immunology, social science. We must go to bigger areas. We must look at environmental science and we must look at the point, at the health of our planet. After all, we have one health, we have one planet, and we have one future. And I'm going to try and use this integrated way of thinking to find solutions to stop pandemics in the future. And I'm gonna take you back, and I'm gonna take you back 2,000 years to the last of the New Testaments, in which we are told that God sits on his throne and his, in his right hand is a scroll. On that scroll are seven seals and the Lion of Judah reaches over and opens four of those seals and there comes forth the four horsemen of the apocalypse. These are the harbingers of the apocalypse and the last day of judgment. And they represent pestilence, famine, war, and conquest. And the astonishing thing to me is that if I was to write that same testament now, I would use almost exactly the same names for those four horse riders. I would, of course, update them, and I would say, no, not pestilence, we're really talking about diseases, we're talking about emerging infections. We're talking about food, we're not talking about famine, we're talking about food security, and in particular, I'm concerned about the state of our livestock. Can I believe, as a European, that there is war in Europe at the moment? I'm still totally staggered about that within my lifetime. And of course, war is essentially about resources. And we're seeing battles over resources develop in sub-Saharan Africa and other places. And conquest over the last 100 years has really been our conquest of nature, how we've disrupted habitats, how we've disrupted our climate, and how things are actually changing. So at the end of the day, one health is about the integration of all those. It's not about any one thing, but it's about how they all interact to influence human health. This is what One Health is. It's about One Health, One Planet, and the future. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to try and get to the point about how we've stopped future pandemics. After all, I really see COVID-19 as being nothing but a rehearsal for the future pandemics. Things that worry me and keep me awake at night is antimicrobial resistance. But let's just focus on what's actually happening with the virus situation. And I'm going to take you to Australia and introduce you to Vic Rails, who is a horse trainer. Vic ran a very successful stable. He came back, he lived, lived north of Brisbane. He came back one home one day and he found a horse sick in his pasture. It was frothy at the mouth, showing very nasty neurological disorders. He called the local vet, a good friend of mine, Peter Reed, came in he had to, and the horse subsequently died. Subsequently, 21 horses were involved in that outbreak. 14 died. Vic himself got the infection and his stable hand got six, but actually recovered. Now, when you have an outbreak like this, as somebody who works on emerging infectious diseases, the first thing you want to know is, what the hell is this pathogen? Is this a pathogen we've seen before, or is this totally novel? And where's it coming from? What is the source, and can we, what can we do to prevent it? Fortunately for us, we don't think we've had any human-to-human -human transmission. 
But if human-to-human -human transmission evolved, then we would be in a very nasty situation. So this virus is a new virus. It's a Hendra virus named after the, in fact, the airport at Brisbane Airport uh, in Brisbane, where the Hendra virus, where, uh, where Vic's stables were. He had 107 horses that died. Um, we, or we've seen more than 107 horses die, and we've seen 11 people die. But as I said, we have not seen any person-to-person -person transmission. If that evolved, as it is with monkeypox today, then we could be in serious poop. Where did it come from? It came from the bats, from the flying foxes that exist down the eastern side of Australia. Research showed us quite quickly that what was happening was that the, virus, the bats were going to feed on trees, fruit trees, in horse paddocks. They were going there for figs and other type of fruits. They were chewing on it. They were pooping and spitting out these bits of uh, half-eaten stuff. And then the horses come along, they snuffle it up. And they were amplifiers. Those intermediate hosts, those bridging hosts, multiply the number of vaccines, uh, sorry, the number of viruses, so that if you're a horse owner, you come along, you see the horse, you open its throat, and you say, oh, it's suffering from something down its throat. You pull its tongue out, and you get a face full of virus, and consequently, you die. So we set up a series of research projects where we would take, uh, capture bats, put solar panels on them to solar uh, radio transmitters, record them, record their behavior. So what are the sort of data we got? Well, first of all, we noticed that spillover events didn't occur in every year. Before 2003, it was only the 94 outbreak that uh, Vic had. Since then, we've seen a subsequent number of outbreaks. It doesn't happen in every year. So there are some years that are spillover years. And spillover is that transmission of the virus from the bat to the humans. And I'm going to focus primarily on that because that's what we don't understand. And it occurs primarily during the winter months. Now our study's shown us that flying foxes usually live in these huge colonies of something like 10,000 bats. But after 2003, they started fissioning into smaller and smaller roosts. So this is a map of Brisbane. And in March, we had 10 roosts. In March 2011, we had 138. The bats were changing their behavior, such they were moving into urban areas. They were, being, uh, they were going to horse paddocks. And they were involved in being seen in the city and places. So their contact rate with humans was increased. Bats usually produce one baby, and the mother cares for it until it's too big to carry. But they started failing in this process. And the, bats start, and the baby bats were starving. They would fall off the ground. And we would see a big increase in the number of bats that were present in bat-caring places. Beekeepers also reported a poor honey crop taking place. And we've seen that there were winter flowering had actually failed. So in Australia, there are like three very important trees for producing nectar during the winter months, and all of those failed. The reason they were failing was because it was wet and cold. And what was happening was cooler temperatures in the East Pacific were driving uh, wet, cold rain into Australia. So the flowering was failing. Now, we used a scientific method here called modelling. Modelling is really important, or I believe it's important, for understanding these complex systems where you have multiple layers. Science is about parsimony. Given those data sets, what is the simplest explanation that captures what takes place? So all this discussion about what happened in the Wuhan Institute and whether that was a people made, uh, whether there was gain of function there, was complete rubbish and complete waste of time because our data showed us that that was not involved right from the start. But nobody ever listened to the scientists because we believe in Occam's razor and the rule of, um, the, the rule of parsimony. This is a complicated figure. I'm going to talk you through it quite quickly. There are two periods, the bats when they were in the big roosts, the bats when they were in the small roosts. The Oceanic Nino Index, when it gets about 0.8 and it goes bright green, that's when we get wet, cold summers. Before 2003, we only saw that one spillover event. But whenever there was an El Nino event, it resulted in no flowering. After that period of time, we saw the one, two, three punch, 
we saw that extreme climatic events resulted in food shortage, and that was causing virus spillover. So we understand and we can predict spillover. This has never been done before. We can't do that for COVID, we can't do that for Ebola, but we can now do this. And this gives us a framework of understanding. But why were the bats changing their behavior? And that's because we have lost so much of the winter habitat because of agricultural development and deforestation that this habitat disruption is driving the whole problems that we face. So habitat disruption interacting with climate is influencing food shortage, which is influencing disease in bats. That goes to horses. That influences human health. I can turn that round and think about that as a cascade if you find that easier. So we can think of it as disruption resulting in this cascade influencing human health. And I can easily align the biology of the bats with the bat behavior, where the virus is, where the shedding is, where the horse susceptibility is. So you can think about this as a series of layers of Swiss cheese. And when all the holes align, then that's when the virus transmits. And that's when the virus gets from bats to humans. Don't forget that we're talking about multiple viruses coming from bats over the past 20, 30 years. Yes, Hendra virus and, of course, COVID came from bats, Ebola, MERS, the SARS one, and Nipah virus as well, which is a virus in Bangladesh which is transmitted by bats when they come and feed on palm juice. They poop in the palm juice, people drink the palm juice, they get infected. We do have human-to-human -human transmission with this, and we've got stuttering chains. So this is in the top of the list of where the future pandemics may come. And this has a case fatality rate of about 45%. COVID is like, what is it, 2%. So my struggle, where I want to transcend, is I want to find a, I want to find a solution for stopping pandemics in the future. Excuse me for one second. I'm going to give you Outbreak 101. All outbreaks of novel viruses are, of course, exponential in growth. They're not linear. And you have a window of about five weeks to have everything ready. If you want to stop that through vaccines, therapeutics, anything, you have basically five weeks. After that, you won't be able to control it. And with politics and everything else, it's gone. So the only way to stop the next pandemic is to stop spillover, to stop that virus getting to humans. The way we can do that, or according to the One Health hypothesis that I put to you, is through rewilding, and rewilding in the native, um, of native uh, habitat. And this is the problem that I want you to help with me. I need to find a sustainable solution. COVID cost us 10 to 100 trillion dollars, but who are the stakeholders that benefit from this? How are we going to be able to stop this? And this is clearly people like businesses, people like tourism, the human health side, the agricultural side. And so what I need to do is to develop a sustainable business model where these individuals pay for rewilding. And only through that way do I believe we can actually look after this uh, planet for the future of our children and look after your health as well. Thank you, Rob. Peter, thank you so much. Thank you. Um, I, I hope you'll all take a moment to uh, connect with Peter, especially if you have ideas for achieving this. Is this not just an academic concept? And Peter is a co-founder of Random Good with Chris Gebhardt. So Chris and his team are working with Peter to tell the story, to reach out. It's a big, complicated ecosystem solution, but it really is the only way we can attack a complicated ecosystem problem. So please reach out to Peter. I'll also point out, Peter, you, you had the image of the four horsemen of the apocalypse. It might, you might note that they were all men, just FYI. Um, <laughs> And COVID-19 was a rehearsal for future pandemics. We have it on record. The Nipah virus is the one, one of the ones to keep an eye on. We have a term of engagement now defined as well, five weeks. Once it starts, we have five weeks to get it under control, or we're going to have another round of the last couple of years. So thanks so much, Peter Hudson.